I'd like to welcome you to my shop. Today, my name is Gary Fjeld. I've been a member of the Guild for about three or four years, and I've been asked to demonstrate cutting boards that, that I make. My cutting board experience started when I received this wood magazine in October of 2006, and that started me on the end grain cutting boards. This is a type of cutting board that was in that magazine. I've also made flag cutting boards and three-dimensional cutting boards. These are all made from the same setup. This is just made a little thicker than what the cutting board is. So with that, we'll start with looking at how I, I design or how I, I make this cutting board. All, all of these cutting boards are made from hard maple, cherry, and walnut. And for this cutting board, you edge glue a two and an eighth inch piece of hard maple, a one inch piece of walnut, a two inch piece of cherry, a one and a half inch piece of hard maple, a one inch piece of walnut, two and a half cherry, and inch and an eighth hard maple. There's nothing magical about those dimensions. This will give you a cutting board that is just under 12 inches wide that allows you, if you've got a 12 inch planer, to run this glue up through your planer. We will uh, cut these for the, the end grain for the cutting board. The main thing is that you want the dimensions such that you will not have glue joints lined up across the cutting board. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the, the saw and the, the dust collector. We'll trim the end of this, and then I will start trimming about an inch and a half wide pieces from here. That dimension will determine the thickness of your cutting board. I like to make my cutting boards at least an, an inch and quarter, inch and three eighths. I cut them at an inch and a half because they are going to be sanded down or planed down to, to clean up the tops of them. I, I built this jig to make sure that I can clamp up these pieces and and get me get good square corners on them. One of the things I do before I glue up is I use a lot of wax paper so that the glue does not stick, stick to my jig. So the first thing you do is just take and turn the pieces, cut pieces on edge. That's the, that's the way they came off the saw. Then all you need to do is every other block, you just take and flip. And that gives you your grain pattern. And there is a cutting board. Now all it takes is a lot of glue and I've got this set up so that I can take and clamp from, from both end, ends. And then I will also put clamps across the top. Yes, this, this is strictly a, a test clamp up. If, if I were going to be doing the final gluing, I would have 
sand or wax paper on the bottom and any place where there is a joint where glue is going to squeeze out so that I can save my jig. And you can see there are saw marks on there. <coughs> now once, once you have glued up that board, it needs to be cleaned up. Two different ways of doing it. I've got a drum sander. I prefer using the drum sander because it gives a much better finish and the problem with that is that it's a very slow process. The other option is to use the planer. Now with end grain, if you're using a planer, you need to put sacrificial boards glued up to the cutting board because if you don't, when that end grain hits the planer, it's going to explode on you. You have to take and glue a sacrificial piece of wood, scrap wood, uh, on the two ends where, where it's going into the, the planer and coming out of the planer. Because if you don't, if, if this were coming out of the planer right now, it would, it would tear out big time. So that, that's the thing. You, if you're using a planer, you have got to use a sacrificial piece of wood. Just glue it on and then once, once you're, you've got it finished, take it back to the table saw and trim it off. It can be any kind of, of scrap wood, you know, pine, whatever. You just need something there to protect that end grain. So this is the, this is the process that I use for making that type of, of cutting board. And like I said, you can change your, your wood material. You can take and change your dimensions. It'll give you a different pattern. As far as gluing this up, I would leave it in here for two to four hours. I've used two different types of glue depending on, on what I have on hand. I've either used Tight Bond 3 or I've used Grizzly polyurethane glue. And uh, the po I, I like the polyurethane glue. It, it foams up, it expands. It's more expensive than the Tight Bond. But I had a customer that had one of my cutting boards that I had put together with uh, the Gorilla polyurethane and he came home from work one night and found out that his wife had run the cutting board through the dishwasher. And surprisingly, it survived and they're still using it. So, you know, they're, they're not made for, for dishwashers. They're not made for soaking in a sink. We'll wipe them off with a damp rag and, and that takes care of them. The thing is, most women are afraid to use it and they just set it on the counter in the kitchen. The flag cutting board. Cherry, maple, and the field is made from walnut. Again, all end grain. The stars are actually carved with a CNC. And on the back of it, I put my name on it. So I've also engraved, In God We Trust. The plans for these cutting boards are available from Next Wave Automation. Get online, go to Next Wave Automation, and go to Projects. And they've got tutorials on it, as well as the, the Vectric files for, for cutting the stars. For the, for the flag, you need 11 pieces of cherry that are 3 quarters of an inch thick by inch and 5 eighths wide by 24 inches long. You need 11 pieces of hard maple, 3 quarter by 1 and 5 eighths by 24 inches. And the plans call for 5 pieces of walnut. I've changed that to 6 pieces of walnut. Again, 3 quarters by inch and 5 eighths by 24 and they are edge glued together. Once they're all glued up into those 11 pieces, then you'll go over to the table saw and you're gonna cut these into whatever thickness you want for your cutting board. Typically, again, I cut an inch and a half or slightly over that so that I can finish close to an inch and a half on the thickness of the, the cutting board. Then what you do, once you've got your strips cut, you're gonna glue up three pieces of cherry and three pieces of maple for the bottom part of the flag. That is this part right here. And you'll then glue up for the, the top piece, four pieces of cherry and three pieces of maple. Now, when you glue them up, they're, it's gonna be that length. You're gonna end up cutting this to eight and a half inches because your stars are gonna go against here. And for your, your walnut, for your star, you're gluing up those inch and a half pieces like this, and that's gonna go like this. Now, one of the things that I do on these is I will, on the router table, I will take and cut a groove on the lower part, the upper part, as well as the edge where the stars go, and on the field, 
so that I can use splines to align these. So now they are aligned but not glued and again I'll come over to my my gluing jig and again when I'm ready to glue use a lot of wax paper to keep it from gluing to my jig and then I will clamp So now those three pieces are clamped together. Now, it still is too long. Once I have finished the gluing and the glue has dried, I will take this blank over to the table saw and again cut this to 16 inches. The finished blank here for the flag is 10 inches high and finished is 16 inches. On here, you want to stagger the joints. So before I have glued these up, I've gone to the table saw and taken that, the, these individual end grains are inch and five eighths. I've cut 13 sixteenths off each of them so I can take and flip them so that my, my glue joints do not align. The maple glue joint is right here. The cherry is right. Here. If they were aligned, you have that weak point that they could split right there. Same way over here on this. You don't have any, any glue joints running the entire length of the cutting board. Once this is finished and I've, I've cut it to length, then I go over to my CNC to cut the stars. The program for cutting the stars is included with the plans on Next Wave Automation. Now I've taken and reprogrammed that just to show the stars. So here on the computer you can see where the stars are going to go and, and on the program I can go in and I can tell it to preview what those stars are going to look like. And there you can see the stars coming up. I put a sanding sealer on the walnut because I don't want my, my white epoxy to migrate into the end grain on that walnut. And, and then later on, it will get sanded off. But for a reference for cutting the stars, I go to the center, X and Y, of the field. And then I go in with a touch plate to determine the Z axis. So I go in and I, I tell it to detect the touch plate. I make sure that there is is uh, contact, it says right up here, success, touch circuit complete, and then I tell it that I, I want to go down to that touch plate. And it knows what the thickness of that touch plate is, so when I take that off, I tell it that I want to move to zero, zero, zero. And it moves down, and I'm at the zero point on the, the field. Then I'll take and load the code for the stars, press OK to begin the program, I'm going to stop it there rather than doing all of them, uh, but it will go through and do all 50 stars. And then what I typically do is go back and run it, readjust the Z axis, bring it down just a couple thousandths of an inch and run it again just to clean up any little bit of, of chips or whatever from the origi original machining. To do the stars, this is white epoxy. What you do is take, and I use Gorilla Epoxy, and a couple drops of white pigment. It's surprising, one or two, three drops is all that it takes of this pigment to take and turn this epoxy entirely white. And then I'll, I'll take like a, a motel key, cut it into a small strip, and use that as a spatula for filling the stars. And I'll fill them slightly oversized, and then I'll come back and sand them, sand them down so that they are smooth. Now one thing I, I just saw and I have not tried it, somebody did pockets for each of, somebody did pockets for each of the stars 
and then made inserts out of hard maple that would fit in those so that you had the hard maple instead of the epoxy. So that takes care of the flag cutting board. It, it is fun to make and uh, it's, it's really pretty easy to make. It's just that it, it takes time and you got a lot of gluing to the, do. The 3D board and there's a DVD on that. Carter Products, Alex Nodgrass demonstrates this at, at every woodworking show. The thing with these is there's a lot of cutting, there's a lot of gluing, waiting for the glue to dry. Then you're cutting, gluing, cutting, gluing. So, so these are time consuming to make. There is a fair amount of scrap with those. These are some of the cutoffs from making the 3D because they, they weren't wide enough for an, another rip cut. I'll take and glue these together and just come up with a ra random pattern for another cutting board. This was made from leftover pieces from three other cutting boards that I just made for a customer. So again, this is a nice little cheese tray. The key for making the 3D cutting boards is your original glue up. You're starting with making sandwiches. You have a 3 8 inch thick piece of hard maple, 3 quarter inch piece of walnut, 3 8 piece of hard maple. On the other sandwich, again, 3 8 hard maple, 3 quarters cherry, 3 8 hard maple, all glued up. Then, once that glue is dry, I'll run one edge through the joiner to clean up that edge, and then I will rip them to the same width on the table saw so that I've got one set up as I'm making them. In the DVD, he uses a band saw. I use the table saw because I just like the table saw better than, than the band saw for consistency and accuracy. Here, here are your two sandwiches that you start out with. Then the first step is to set your table saw blade to 30 degrees. You want to be sure that you are accurate with the 30 degrees. You don't want to rely on the gauge on your table saw. I don't care how good your table saw is, that 30 degrees may not be 30 degrees. It may be 28 degrees or 32 degrees. So I, I use one of these angle cube on the blade to make sure I'm at 30 degrees. Then the next step is to take and cut the edge on your two sandwiches. At 30 degrees, you're gonna come up so that you just clear the top piece of your sandwich. You'll do that on both of them. Then adjust your fence on your, your table saw so that you can get a one inch wide strip. And do that on both pieces, adjust your fence, and continue to make those one inch strips until you've used up as much board as you can. Then what you're going to do is take that strip and you are going to cut off this ear. You're going to actually turn it like that and you're going to cut off that ear so that it will be like that. You're, you're just down leaving a little bit of the hard maple. You'll do that on on all the pieces that you've cut. Then you're going to turn that those strips over. You're going to do the same thing on the other side. Again, you're cutting off, trimming off this ear. Then once you've done that, now you go to your planer and you're going to run your pieces through like this and you're going to come down to eliminate that bevel on one side, then you're gonna flip them over to the other side. So that, that is the first cut there. This is, is cut flat, and you can see there's a slight amount of color. Okay, so now, now you have got good square pieces. Now it's time to glue again. So you're gonna take and glue up the individual pieces. You're gonna wanna start with one color, whether it be maple or walnut or cherry, and alternate. You've got your walnut piece, maple, cherry, walnut, cherry, walnut, cherry, walnut, and cherry. Whatever color you start with, you want to end with the opposite color. And you want to look at these to make sure that you have a V pattern with your colors. 
And before you glue, make sure you go back and check again. So now you, you have glued them up. Then you end up, once the glue is dried, you run that board back through the planer to clean it up. This is a piece that's been through the planer. You're going to plane it down so that you just right at the, the point of the maple. And once you've done that, you're ready to cut again. So let's go back over to the, the table saw again. And again, I'm going to be cutting these into about inch and a half strips. And then it's back over to my cutting board jig again. I will typically run about a three foot long board. These were shorter. I had to have these pieces. I don't like to go anything more than four because it just gets to be too hard to handle. Now there are the pieces that I just cut. We're going to turn them on edge. Now you can see how everything is lined up. Walnut's going this direction, cherry's going this direction. What we're going to do is take every other one, flip it, and, and turn it like that. So every other one we will take and flip and turn. And there we have that 3D pattern. And again, if you look, all the walnut is going down to the left. The cherry is going down to the right. And again, voice of experience, make sure you check everything before you glue, because I have messed up maybe something like that, and I didn't catch it until I glued it. And then I ended up. In order to salvage the board, I ended up cutting this piece out. So I was able to salvage it, but it, it's, a, it's a pain in the tush when that happens. So there is a 3D cheese board. Once, once it's glued up, you need to either run it through a planer with, a sacri with sacrificial boards on it, or run it through a drum sander. Like I said, I prefer the drum sander. I will, on all of these cutting boards, on the drum sander, I will start with a 120, and I have had extremely good luck using FinTech abrasives that is no longer a patron sponsor of ours, but using zirconium oxide on my uh, belts for my drum sander. It has done an extremely good job. And then I will change to a 150 grit through the drum sander, and then I'll come over to my bench and use a random orbital and go up to 220 typically. I, don't, I usually don't go more than 220 on any of them. Now to finish the boards, I've used three different products. I started out with butcher block oil that is available at Rockler Woodcraft. This runs about $12 for a bottle. It is 16 ounces. Then I heard some people were using food grade mineral oil. Amazon, food grade mineral oil, gallon, $18. With the mineral oil, what I would do is pour this into a tote that my cutting boards would fit in and just let them soak overnight. Then just recently, I tried walrus oil. Very pleased with walrus oil. That's a, a new patron sponsor of ours. Excellent job. This eight ounces is about $10. Now, one of the things before I put any of that finish on, after they've been glued up, sanded to the 220, I will take those cutting boards, I will take a wet rag, wet down both sides of the cutting board, let it dry, let it sit for a couple of hours, hit it with that 220, because this stuff 
will grow. I'll take and wet them down again, let them dry, sand them to 220, wet them again, sand them. And that three times usually takes care of any grain growth on them. And then I will take and put whichever finish I'm going to put on them. Now one other thing that, that I do with my cutting boards is put rubber feet on the bottom of them. Two reasons for that. One, it keeps them from sliding on the countertops. The other reason is it gives an air gap between the bottom of the cutting board and the countertop. With moisture, it can be slippery. It can start penetrating if, you, if it's just left there sitting on that moisture. The same thing as a, as a two inch cutting board. And then I've got a program who will take and dish out the top as well as the bottom. Eight, eight, eighth inch ball nose and they're made so, or the program is such that you only move over about five thousandths of an inch on each pass. So it is a long process to do that. I start with a, a half inch ball nose just to make the first pass through here to, to clear out the depth. Then I'll go to the eighth inch and it'll start, it actually angles through it all the way through. When it makes that first cut, it's going down about an eighth of an inch at a time to that full inch and a half depth. I like Freud. That's my cutting boards. Here I've got a completed plank that I would use in a cutting board. This one is going to be part of an ingrain cutting board. Okay, so this is the plank. Two maples and black walnut of various grades, um, sapwoods and heartwoods, so I've got some different colors in here. We're going to cut this in little slices so we can turn them up on end to make an ingrain cutting board. So the next step is to show you the table saw sled that's customized to make these very accurately. This one got modified yesterday for this saw. It was still set up for the uh, crest. The vacuum system is hooked in to the cabinet of the saw and has also a line that comes up here to this. When you're cutting these planks, you want to cut a very consistent length. If not, when you go to glue up the ingrain strips, you've got a tremendous amount of sanding. So you want them very, very consistent. And that's not horrible on a standard sled with a stop. But when you're getting down to the last cuts, the width of the plank is very short. So holding the angle critical and accurately to the blade and some safety items as well, I've got this stop which pivots into place you push the plank against it and then you can release the stop so it's not cat the wood is not captured against the blade and this little device presses down and holds the plank down in place so the first cut is just to square up the edge of the plank Pivot the stop in, push the plank up, clamp it, release the stop. And you repeat until your plank is used up. We're only going to get one more strip, but how to make sure that that's perfectly parallel and held safely with your fingers out of the way is just identical to every other cut that we've just made. My personal preference is normally is to flip them, turn them over, get different. If that was a constant, all dark walnuts like this, I'd probably leave them just like this. 
because this is a mixture. It's more appealing to me if I kind of turn it into a camouflage pattern. I organize the walnut and all, and I spell out letters in my cutting boards, LSU, you know, UGA. But this one is going to be just a pattern. Well, it's got the maple, hard maple on the outside. So I grab two of these that are nothing but hard maple. And let's say like we're going to make a cutting board that large. So I just kind of mix it up and, you know, different things. There's kind of just, you know, those two are two. I like maybe doing that. Maybe I'm going to flip every other one because those two are very light there. So I like that. All right, this is a custom clamp that I've built. Uh, three quarter by two and a half aluminum bar, three quarter by one and a half steel bar. I tap these for half inch all thread. Uh, the modules of bending on these are about equal. I've got shoulder bolts in the bottom to space it up off the table. I turn it on the table like so. I have this square mounted to keep this edge of the boards square to here. I also have some adjustments. I have spacers made that I can put under so that these planks, when placed in here, are about centered on the clamping force. And being the lazy person that I am, I'll use my little cordless Ryobi to adjust that. These clamps are limited to about 15 inches, but that's what I make most of is boards that are this wide. I just, all the repeating reuse of the components. But I'll show you one thing that I do. Because those are sawn edges, tops and bottom, I sand the uh, strands of wood that are hanging out from the edge from all of my saw cuts. I sand them. I have my wax paper. I use lots of wax paper. I've got my pattern maintained. I'll put my first one in. I'm stuck on tight bond three for my cutting boards for sure in almost everything I build. The cost difference between tight bond three, two, and one is so minuscule. People ask me, how many cutting boards? I don't know, but I've used 16 gallons of glue in my hobby so far because I just write the number on the bottle every time I replace it. That's been about in eight years so. So then you just take and turn up pieces like so. Um, depending on how much glue you really got and how well you spread it out. If you slide the boards, that makes sure that the glue is smeared out perfectly in between them. So we're clamping on the center of the boards. I snug it up because even with this, it's pulling perfectly on the center line and evenly, and I've got it square, it'll still move. Um, you have to take your time and eyeball and line up. This is really great and better than anything else I found, but it don't do it by itself still. And what I'll do there, yep, I'm sitting right there. I end up. Even after I snug it up, I haven't let it set too long. I can still move them boards against one another, getting some alignment. Run my top finger across the top and make sure everything's still going good on top to bottom. When you start getting into it, you see the glue start running out. I don't know, I didn't calculate force calculations on 
how much force I can put on this, but it don't come apart, not on the glue seams. Yeah. All right, and I've got five of these so I can glue up five ingrain cutting boards at one time. I do scrape the glue off of this top side. I don't see any problem running the glue through the planer, especially with the helical spiral cutter heads. Uh, some people argue that point and I'll let them talk and then I'll say okay. Uh, but running it through my drum sander, absolutely not. You do not want to leave any glue up there because the glue will get in your belt and gum it up and then you got to burn marks. This maple is raised on this end that wasn't like that a minute ago. So as that glue is moving around underneath that pressure, it will move. So I'm gonna stop. How long do you keep it in there? 24 hours. Yeah, I felt it raise, and I said, whoop, it moved after I clamped it from the, as that glue moves around between the boards, it'll cause the boards to move. And as much as I like to say, well, let me build something that prevents that, and at some point, it's a lost cause of building too much stuff to take care. Mineral oil, and I'll use mineral oil. I got a bath in there, and I can show you my drying rack. Um, and then I will put um, Howard's Butcher Block Conditioner as a final coat because it's got some waxes in it. So I set this off to dry for a day.